preface of the talking thrush and other tales from india this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales the talking thrush and other tales from india retold by w h d rouse and collected by w crook preface the stories contained in this little book are only a small part of a large collection of indian folk tales made by mr crook in the course of the ethnological survey of the northwest provinces and oud some were recorded by the collector from the lips of the jungle folk of mirzapur others by his native assistant pandit ramgarib chabe besides these a large number were received from all parts of the provinces in response to a circular issued by mr j c nesfield the director of public instruction to all teachers of village schools the present selection is confined to the beast stories which are particularly interesting as being mostly indigenous and little affected by so-called aryan influence most of them are new or have been published only in the north indian notes and queries referred to as n i n q in the retelling for which mr rouse is responsible a number of changes have been made the text of the book is meant for children and consequently the first aim has been to make an interesting story those who study folk tales for any scientific purpose will find all such changes marked in the notes if the change is considerable the original document is summarized it should be added that these documents are merely brief notes in themselves without literary interest the notes also give the source of each tale and a few obvious parallels or references to the literature of the subject end of preface part one of the talking thrush and other tales from india retold by w h d rouse this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the talking thrush the rabbit and the monkey the sparrow's revenge the judgment of the jackal the talking thrush a certain man had a garden and in his garden he sowed cotton seeds by and by the cotton seeds grew up into a cotton bush with big brown pods upon it these pods burst open when they are ripe and you can see the fluffy white cotton bulging all white out of the pods there was a thrush in this garden and the thrush thought within herself how nice and soft the cotton looked she plucked out some of it to line her nest with and never before was her sleep so soft as it was on that bed of cotton now this thrush had a clever head so she thought something more might be done with cotton besides lining a nest in her flights abroad she used often to pass by the door of a cotton carder the cotton carder had a thing like a bow made of a piece of wood and a thong of leather tying the ends together into a curve he used to take the cotton and pile it in a heap then he took the carding bow and twang twang twanged it among the heap of cotton so that the fibres or threads of it became disentangled then he rolled it up into oblong balls and sold it to other people who made it into thread the thrush often watched the cotton carder at work every day after dinner she went to the cotton tree and plucked out a fluff of cotton in her beak and hid it away she went on doing this till at last she had quite a little heap of cotton all her own at least it was not really her own because she stole it but then you cannot get policemen to take up a thrush for stealing and as men catch thrushes and put them in a cage all for nothing it is only fair the birds should have their turn when the heap of cotton was big enough our thrush flew to the house of the cotton carder and sat down in front of him good day man said the thrush good day birdie said the cotton carder the thrush was not a bit afraid because she knew he was a kind man who never caught little birds to put them in a cage he liked better to hear them singing free in the woods man said the thrush i have a heap of beautiful cotton and i'll tell you what 
you shall have half of it if you will card the rest and make it up into balls for me oh, that i will said the man where is it if you will come with me said the thrush i'll show you so the thrush flew in front and the man followed after and they came to the place where the hoard of cotton was hidden away the man took the cotton home and carded it and made it into balls half of the cotton he took for his trouble and the rest he gave back to the thrush he was so honest that he did not cheat even a bird although he could easily have done so for birds cannot count and if you find a nest full of eggs and take one or two the mother bird will never miss them but if you take all the bird is unhappy not far away from the carter lived a spinner this man used to put a ball of cotton on a stick and then he pulled out a bit of the cotton without breaking it and tied it to another little stick with a weight on it then he twisted the weight and set it a spinning and as it span he held the cotton ball in one hand and pulled out the cotton with the other working it between finger and thumb to keep it fine thus the spindle went on spinning and the cotton went on twisting until it was twisted into thread that is why the man was called a spinner it looks very easy to do when you can do it but it is really very hard to do well to this spinner the thrush came and after bidding him good day said she mr spinner i have some balls of cotton all ready to spin into thread will you spin one half of them into thread for me if i give you the other half that i will said mr spinner and away they went to find the cotton balls thrush first and the spinner following in a very few days the spinner had spun all the cotton into the finest thread then he took a pair of scales and weighed it into two equal parts he was an honest man too half he kept for himself and the other half he gave to the thrush the next thing this clever thrush did was to fly to the house of a weaver the weaver used to buy thread and fasten a number of threads to a wooden frame called a loom which was made of two upright posts with another bar fastened across the top the threads were hung to the crossbar and a little stone was tied to the bottom of each to keep it steady then the weaver wound some more thread around a long stick called a shuttle and the shuttle he pushed in front of one thread and behind the next until it had gone right across the whole of the threads in and out then he pushed it back in the same way and after a bit the upright threads and the cross threads were woven together and made a piece of cloth the thrush flew down to the weaver and they made the same bargain as before the weaver wove all the thread into pieces of cloth and half he kept for himself but the other half he returned to the thrush so now the thrush had some beautiful cloth and i dare say you wonder what she wanted it for as you have not been inquisitive i will tell you she wanted clothes to dress herself the thrush had noticed that men and women walking about wore clothes and being an ambitious thrush and eager to rise in the world she felt it would not be proper to go about without any clothes on so she now went to a tailor and said to him good mr tailor i have some pieces of very fine cloth and i should be much obliged if you would make a part of it into clothes for me you shall keep one half of the cloth for your trouble the tailor was very glad of this job as times were slack so he took the cloth and at once set to work half of it he made into a beautiful dress for the thrush with a skirt and jacket and sleeves in the latest fashion and as there was a little cloth left over and he was an honest tailor he made her also a pretty little hat to put on her head then the thrush was indeed delighted and felt there was little more to desire in the world she put on her skirt and her jacket with fashionable sleeves and the little hat and looked at her image in a river and was mightily pleased with herself now she became so vain that nothing would do but she must show herself to the king so she flew and flew and away she flew until she came to the king's palace 
Into the king's palace she flew, and into the great hall, where the king sat, and the queen, and all the courtiers. There was a peg high up on the wall, and the thrush perched on this peg and began to sing. "'Oh, look there!' cried the queen, who was the first to see this wonderful sight. "'See, a thrush in a jacket and skirt and a pretty hat!' Everybody looked at the thrush, singing on her peg, and clapped their hands. "'Come here, Bertie,' said the king, "'and show the queen your pretty clothes.' The thrush felt highly flattered, and flew down upon the table, and took off her jacket to show the queen. Then she flew back to her peg, and watched to see what would happen. The queen turned over the jacket in her hand, and laughed. Then she folded it up, and put it in her pocket. "'Give me my jacket!' twittered the thrush. "'I shall catch cold, and besides it is not proper for a lady to be seen without a jacket.' Then they all laughed, and the king said, "'Come here, Mistress Thrush, and you shall have your jacket.' Down flew the thrush upon the table again, but the king caught her and held her fast. "'Let me go!' squeaked the thrush, struggling to get free. But the king would not let her go. I am afraid that although he was a king, he was not so honest as the carter or the spinner, and cared less for his word than the weaver and the tailor. "'Greedy king,' said the thrush, "'to covet my little jacket.' "'I covet more than your jacket,' said the king. "'I covet you, and I am going to chop you up into little bits.' Then he began to chop her up into bits. As she was being chopped up, the thrush said, "'The king snips and cuts like a tailor, but he's not so honest.' When the king had finished chopping her up, he began to wash the pieces, and each piece, as he washed it, called out, the king scours and scrubs like a washerwoman, but he is not so honest. Then the king put the pieces of the thrush into a frying pan with oil and began to fry them, but the pieces went on calling out, The king is like a cook, frying and sputtering, but he is not so honest. When she was fried, the king ate her up. From within the body of the king still the thrush kept calling out, I am inside the king, it is just like the inside of any other man, only not so honest. The king became like a walking musical box, and he did not like it at all, but it was his own fault. Wherever he went, everybody heard the thrush crying out from inside the king, just like any other man, only not so honest. Everybody that heard this began to despise the king. At last the king could stand it no longer. He sent for his doctor and said, Doctor, you must cut this talking bird out of me. Your majesty will die if I do, said the doctor. I shall die if you don't, answered the king, for I cannot endure being made a fool of. So there was nothing for it. The doctor took his knives and made a hole in the king and pulled out the thrush. Strange to say, the pieces of the thrush had all joined together again, and away she flew but her beautiful clothes were all gone. However, it was a lesson she never forgot, and after that she slept soft in her nest of cotton, and never again tried to ape her betters. As for the king, he died, and a good riddance, too. His son became king in his stead, and all life long he remembered his father's miserable death, and kept all his promises to men and beasts and birds. THE RABBIT AND THE MONKEY once upon a time there lived in the mountains a rabbit and a monkey who were great friends one day as they sat by the roadside hobnobbing together who should come by but a man with a bamboo pole over his shoulder and at each end of the pole was a bundle hung to a string and there were plantains in one bundle and sugar in the other said the monkey to the rabbit friend of my heart do as i shall tell you go and sit upon the road in front of that man and as soon as he sees you run he is sure to drop his load and follow then i will pick up his load and hide it safely and when you come back we shall share it together no sooner said than done the rabbit ran and the man dropped his burden and ran after him when the monkey who had been hiding in the tall grass by the wayside pounced upon the sugar and the plantains and climbed up into a tree and began to gobble them up at his leisure by and by the man came back 
hot and empty-handed, and finding that his goods were gone as well as the rabbit, cursed loudly and went home to be scolded by his wife. Soon the rabbit came back too and began hunting about for his friend the monkey. High and low he searched and not a trace could he find, till he happened to cast his eyes aloft, and lo and behold there was Mr. Monkey up in a tree munching away with every sign of enjoyment. "'Hello, friend,' said he. "'Come down out of that.' "'I'm very comfortable here, thank you,' said the monkey. "'But where's my share?' asked the rabbit indignantly. "'All gone, all gone,' mumbled the monkey, and pelted him with the plantain peel and balls of paper made out of the packets where the sugar had been. "'Why did you stay so long? I got hungry and could not wait any longer.' The rabbit thought his friend was joking and would not believe it, but it was only too true. The greedy creature had not left a scrap. "'Do you really mean it?' said the poor rabbit. "'If you don't believe me, come and see,' said the monkey, and seizing the rabbit by his long ears, he hauled him up into the tree, and after mocking him and making great game, he left him there and went away. Now the rabbit was afraid to jump down from such a height for fear of breaking his neck. So up in the tree he remained for a long time. Many animals passed under the tree, but none took pity on the rabbit, until at last came an old and foolish rhinoceros, who rubbed his withered hide against the trunk. "'Kind rhinoceros,' said the rabbit, "'let me jump down upon your back.' The rhinoceros, being a simple creature, agreed. Down came the rabbit with such a thud that the rhinoceros fell on his stupid old nose and broke his fat old neck and died. The rabbit ran away, and away he ran, until he came to the king's palace, and he hid under the king's golden throne. By and by in came the king, and in came the court. All the grandees stood around in their golden robes, glittering with rubies and diamonds, and their swords were girt about their waists. Suddenly they all heard a terrific sneeze. Everybody said, God bless you, while the king thundered out, Who has the bad manners to sneeze in the king's presence? Everybody looked at his neighbor and wondered who did it. Off with his head, shouted the king. Another sneeze came. This time, however, everybody was on the watch, and they noticed that the sound came from under the king's golden throne. So they dived in and lugged out the rabbit, looking more dead than alive. "'All right,' said the king. "'Off with his head!' The executioner ran to get his sword. But our friend the rabbit, for all he was frightened, had his wits about him, and sitting up on his hind legs and putting his two forepaws together, he said respectfully, "'O oh, great king, strike, but here. If thou wilt send a score of men with me, I will give thee a dead rhinoceros.' The king laughed, the courtiers laughed, loud and long. However, just to see what would come of it, the king gave him a score of men. The rabbit led them to the place where the rhinoceros fell on his stupid old nose, and there he lay dead. With great difficulty the men dragged the rhinoceros home. They were very pleased to get a rhinoceros, because his horn is good for curing many diseases, and the court physician ground his horn into powder, and made out of it a most wonderful medicine, and the king was so pleased that he gave the rabbit a fine new coat, and a horse to ride on. So the rabbit put on his fine coat, and got on the back of his horse, and rode off. On the way, who should meet him but his friend the monkey? hello said the monkey where did you get all that finery the king gave it to me says the rabbit says the monkey and why should the king give all this to a fool like you the rabbit replied i whom you call a fool got it by sneezing under the king's golden throne such a lucky sneeze that the soothsayers prophesied to the king long life and many sons then he rode away the monkey fell a-thinking how nice it would be if he could get a fine coat and horse, as the rabbit had done. I can sneeze, thought he. What if I try my luck? So he scampered away, and away he scampered, till he came to the king's palace, and hid himself under the king's golden throne. When the king came in, and all his courtiers in gorgeous array as before, 
Our monkey underneath the throne sneezed in the most auspicious manner he could contrive. "'Who is that?' thundered the king, glaring about him. "'Who has the bad manners to sneeze in the king's presence?' They searched about until they found the monkey hidden under the throne and hauled him out. "'What hast thou, wily tree-climber?' asked the king, "'that I should not bid the executioner cut off thy head.' The monkey had no answer ready. At last he said, "'O king, I have some plantain peel and pellets of paper.' But the king was angry at this, and the greedy monkey was led away, and his head was cut off. THE SPARROW'S REVENGE Once there was a pair of sparrows that were very fond of each other, and lived in a nest together as happy as the day was long. The hen laid eggs and sat upon them, and the cock went about picking up food for them both, and when he had got food enough he sat on a twig close by the nest and twittered for joy. But it happened one day that a boy saw Cock Sparrow pecking at some seeds, and he picked up a stone and threw it at him and killed him. So no food came home that morning, and Hen Sparrow grew anxious and at last set out to find him. In a little while she found his dead body lying in a ditch. She ruffled up her feathers and began to cry. "'Who can have killed him?' she said. "'My poor kind husband, who never did harm to any one.' Then a raven flew down from a tree where he had been sitting, and told her how a cruel boy had thrown a stone at him and killed him for sport. He saw it, said the raven, as he was sitting on the tree." Now Hen Sparrow determined to have her revenge. She was so much troubled that she left her eggs to hatch themselves, or to addle if they would, and gathering some straw she plaited it into a beautiful straw carriage with two old cotton reels for wheels and sticks for the shafts. Then she went to the hole of a rat who was a friend of hers and called down the hole, Mr. Rat, Mr. Rat. Yes, Mrs. Sparrow, said the rat coming out of the hole and making a polite bow. "'Someone has thrown a stone at my husband and killed him. Will you help me to get my revenge?' "'Why,' said the rat, "'how can I help you?' "'By pulling me along in my carriage,' said Mrs. Sparrow. "'Oh, yes,' said the rat, "'that I will.' So he went down into his hole again, and washed his face and combed his whiskers, and came up all spick and span." Mrs. Sparrow tied the shafts of the straw carriage to the rat, and Mrs. Sparrow got in, and off they went. On the road they met a scorpion. Said the scorpion, "'Whither away, Mrs. Sparrow and Mr. Rat?' Said the hen sparrow, "'My friend, Mr. Rat is pulling me along in my carriage of straw to punish a cruel boy who threw a stone at my husband and killed him.' "'Quite right, too,' said the scorpion. "'May I come and help you?' I have a beautiful sting in my tail. Oh, please do, come and get in, said the sparrow. In got the scorpion, and away they went. By and by they saw a snake. Good day, and God bless you, says the snake. Where are you going, may a mere reptile ask? Mr. Scorpion and I are going to punish a cruel boy who threw a stone and killed my husband. Shall I come and help you, asked the snake. I have fine teeth in my head to bite with. The more the merrier, replied Mrs. Sparrow. So in he got. They had not gone far before who should meet them but a wolf. Hello, says the wolf gruffly. Where are you off to? I should like to know. Mr. Rat is kind enough to draw me in my carriage, and we are going to punish a cruel boy who threw a stone and killed my poor husband. May I come too? growled the wolf. I can bite. He opened his big jaws and snarled. Oh, how kind you are, said Mrs. Sparrow. Do come, jump in, jump in. The poor rat looked aghast at such a load to pull, but he was a gentlemanly rat, and so, having offered to pull the carriage, he said nothing. So the big wolf got in and nearly sat on the scorpion's tail. If he had, he wouldn't have sat long, I think. However, the scorpion got out of the way, and on they went, all four, the poor rat pulling with all his might, but rather slow at that. In due time they arrived at the cruel boy's house. His mother was cooking the dinner, and his father was fast asleep in a chair. 
there was a river close by the house and the wolf went down to the river and hid himself there the snake crawled among the peats and the scorpion began to climb up into the chair where the man was sleeping then mrs hen sparrow flew in at the door and twittered little boy little boy there's a fish biting at your night line up jumped the boy and out he ran to look at the night line but as he was stooping down and looking at the line to see if any fish were hooked the wolf pounced upon him and bit him in the throat and he died then the cruel boy's mother went out to get some peats and as she put her hand in amongst them the snake bit her and she gave a shriek and fell down and died the shriek awoke her husband sleeping in his chair and he began to get up but by this time the scorpion had climbed up the leg of the chair so he stung the man and the man died too thus there was an end of the cruel boy who killed a harmless sparrow for sport and though his father and mother had done nothing yet they ought not to have had a son so cruel or at least they might have brought him up better anyhow a die they did all three and mrs hen sparrow was so delighted that she forgot all about her dead husband and forgot her eggs which were getting addled and went about chirruping until she found another husband and made another nest and i am sorry to say lived happily ever after the judgment of the jackal a merchant was returning home from a long voyage riding upon a mule as he drew near home night overtook him and he was forced to look out for shelter seeing a mill by the roadside he knocked at the door come in said the miller may i stay here for the night asked the merchant by all means said the miller if you pay me well the merchant thought this rather mean because in those days a stranger was made welcome everywhere without paying anything however he made the best of it and came in the miller led off his mule to the stable please take care of my mule said the merchant i have still a long way to go oh said the miller your mule will be all right and then he rubbed him down and fed him in the morning the merchant asked for his mule i am very sorry said the miller he must have got loose last night and i can't find him anywhere the merchant was much dismayed he went out to look for himself and there to be sure was his mule tied by the halter to the mill why look here miller says he here is the mule oh no said the miller that mule is mine yours said the merchant getting angry last night your stable was empty and don't you think i know my own mule that is mine said the miller again my mill had a young mule in the night and that is he the merchant was now very angry indeed but he could not help himself as he did not want to fight he was a very peaceful merchant so he said well i have no doubt it's all right but just to satisfy me let us ask the reverend dr jackal to decide between us and whatever he says i will abide by very good answered the miller and away they went to the den of his reverence the jackal dr jackal was sitting with his hind legs crossed and smoking a hubble bubble good morning worthy gentlemen said the jackal how can i serve you said the merchant last night my lord judge i lodged with this miller here and he took charge of my mule but now he says it has run away though i saw it with my own eyes tied by the halter to his mill he says that the mule i saw is his and that his mill is the mother of it and that it was born last night while i was asleep go back to the mill said the jackal and wait for me i will just wash my face and then i'll settle your business they went away and waited a long time but no jackal late in the afternoon they got tired of waiting for the jackal and determined to go and look for him there he was still sitting in his den and smoking a hubble bubble why didn't you come asked the miller we have been waiting for you all day oh my dear sir i was too busy said the jackal when i went to wash my face i found that all the water had caught fire i have just put it out you must be mad your reverence said the miller who ever heard of water catching fire and who ever heard replied the jackal of a mill having a young mule 
The miller saw that he was found out, and was so much ashamed that he gave back the mule to its owner, and the merchant went home. End of Part 1「The Talking Thrush and Other Tales from India」retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. How the Mouse Got Into His Hole, King Solomon and the Owl, The Camel's Neck, The Quail and the Fowler, The King of the Kites, The Jackal and the Camel, The Wise Old Shepherd. How the Mouse Got Into His Hole a merchant was going along the road one day with a sack of peas on the back of an ox the ox was stung by a fly and gave a kick and down fell the sack a mouse was passing by and the merchant said mousie if you will help me up with this sack i will give you a pea the mouse helped him up with the sack and got a pea for his trouble he stole another and a third he found on the road when he got home with his three peas, he planted them in front of his hole. As he was planting them, he said to them, If you are not all three sprouting by tomorrow, I'll cut you in pieces and give you to the black ox. The peas were terribly frightened, and the next morning they had already begun to sprout, and each of them had two shoots. Then he said, if i don't find you in blossom to-morrow i'll cut you in pieces and give you to the black ox when he went to look next day they were all in blossom so he said if i don't find ripe peas on you to-morrow i'll cut you in pieces and give you to the black ox next day they had pods full of ripe peas on them so every day he used to eat lots of peas and in this manner he got very fat one day a pretty young lady mouse came to see him. "'Good morning, Sleeky,' said she. "'How are you?' "'Good morning, Squeaky,' said he. "'I'm quite well, thank you.' "'Why, Sleeky,' said she, "'how fat you are.' "'Am I?' said he. "'I suppose that's because I have plenty to eat.' "'What do you eat, Sleeky?' asked the pretty young lady mouse. "'Peas, Squeaky,' said the other. "'Where do you get them, Sleeky?' They grow all of themselves in my garden, Squeaky. Will you give me some, please? asked the lady mouse. Oh, yes, if you will stay in my garden, you may have as many as you like. So Squeaky stayed in Sleeky's garden, and they both ate so many peas that they got fatter and fatter every day. One day Squeaky said to Sleeky, Let's try which can get into the hole quickest squeaky was slim and she had not been at the peas so long as sleeky so she got into the hole easily enough but sleeky was so fat that he could not get in at all he was very much frightened and went off in hot haste to the carpenter and said to him carpenter please pare off a little flesh from my ribs so that i can get into my hole do you think i have nothing better to do than paring down your ribs said the carpenter angrily and went on with his work the mouse went to the king and said o king i can't get into my hole and the carpenter will not pare down my ribs will you make him do it get out said the king do you think i have nothing better to do than look after your ribs so the mouse went to the queen said he queen i can't get into my hole and the king won't tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs please divorce him bother you and your ribs said the queen i am not going to divorce my husband because you have made yourself fat by eating too much the mouse went to the snake snake bite the queen and tell her to divorce the king because he will not tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole get away said the snake or i'll swallow you up ribs and all the fatter you are the better i shall be pleased he went to the stick and said stick beat the snake because she won't bite the queen who won't divorce the king and make him tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole off with you said the stick i'm sleepy because i have just beaten a thief i can't be worried about your ribs he went to the furnace and said furnace burn the stick and make it beat the snake 
that he may bite the queen and make her divorce the king who won't tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole get along with you said the furnace i am cooking the king's dinner and i have no time now to see about your ribs he went to the ocean and said ocean put out the fire and make it burn the stick so that it may beat the snake and the snake may bite the queen and she may divorce the king who won't tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole ah oh, don't bother me said the ocean it's high tide and all the fishes are jumping about and giving me no rest he went to the elephant and said o oh, elephant drink up the ocean that it may put out the fire and the fire may burn the stick and the stick may beat the snake and the snake may bite the queen and the queen may divorce the king and make him tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole go away little mouse said the elephant i have just drunk up a whole lake and i really can't drink any more he went to the creeper and said dear creeper do please choke the elephant that he may drink up the ocean and the ocean may put out the fire and the fire may burn the stick and the stick may beat the snake and the snake may bite the queen and the queen may divorce the king and the king may tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole not i says the creeper i am stuck fast here to this tree and i couldn't get away to please a fat little mouse then he went to the scythe and said scythe please cut loose the creeper that it may choke the elephant and the elephant may drink up the ocean and the ocean may put out the fire and the fire may burn the stick and the stick may beat the snake and the snake may bite the queen and the queen may divorce the king and the king may tell the carpenter to pare down my ribs and let me get into my hole with pleasure said the scythe who is always sharp so the scythe cut the creeper loose and the creeper began to choke the elephant and the elephant ran off and began to drink up the ocean and the ocean began to put out the fire and the fire began to burn the stick and the stick began to beat the snake and the snake began to bite the queen and the queen told the king she was going to divorce him and the king was frightened and ordered the carpenter to pare sleeky's ribs and at last sleeky got into his hole king solomon and the owl once king solomon was hunting all alone in the forest night fell and king solomon lay down under a tree to sleep over his head on the branch of a tree sat a huge owl and the owl hooted so loud and so long to wit to woo to wit to woo that solomon could not sleep solomon looked up at the owl and said tell me o owl why do you hoot all night long upon the trees said the owl i hoot to waken those that sleep as soon as day's first beams do peep that they may rise and say their prayers and not be caught in this world's cares then he went on again to wit to woo shaking his solemn old head to and fro he was a melancholy owl and i think he must have been crossed in love solomon thought this owl very clever to roll out beautiful poetry like that off-hand as it were he asked the owl again tell me o wise owl why do you shake your very solemn old head said the owl i shake my head to let all know this world is but a fleeting show men's days are flying with quick wings so take no joy in earthly things yet men will fix their hearts below upon the pleasures that must go their joy is gone when they are dead and that is why i shake my head this touched king solomon in a tender place for he was himself rather fond of earthly delights he sighed and asked again o oh, most ancient and wise owl tell me why you never eat grain answered the owl the bearded grain i do not eat because when adam ate some wheat he was turned out of paradise so adam's sin has made me wise if i should eat a single grain the joys of heaven i should not gain and so to keep my erring feet the bearded grain i never eat thought solomon to himself i don't remember reading that story in genesis but perhaps he is right i must look it up when i get home then he spoke to the owl once more and said and now good owl tell me why you drink no water at night said the owl 
since water all the world did drown in noah's day i will drink none were i to drink a single drop my life would then most likely stop solomon was delighted to find the owl so wise oh my owl said he all my life long i have been looking for a counsellor who had reasons to give for what he did i have never found one until i found you now i beg you to come home with me to-morrow and you shall be my chief counsellor and whatever i purpose i will first ask your advice the owl was equally delighted and said thank you thinking of the greatness that was to be his the owl stopped crying to wit to woo and solomon went to sleep the camel's neck once upon a time there was a very religious camel at least he was religious after the fashion of his country that is he used to mortify his flesh by fasting and scratch himself with thorns and lie awake all night meditating upon the emptiness of the world that is what men used to do in that country in order to please their gods one of these gods was very much pleased with the piety of the camel so one night as the camel was fasting and saying over and over to himself vanity of vanities all is vanity the god appeared before him he was a curious-looking god and he had four hands instead of two but the camel did not mind that nor did he laugh on the contrary he went down on his knees and bowed before him o oh, camel said this god i have seen your fasting and heard your prayers and i have come to reward you choose what boon you like and it shall be yours o oh, mighty god i should like to have a neck eight miles long the god answered be it so and immediately the camel felt his neck shooting out like a telescope until it was eight miles long it shot out so fast that the camel found it hard to escape running his head against the trees however he steered it successfully barring a bump or two and as by the time his neck stopped growing he was far out of sight of the god he could not even say thank you now perhaps you will wonder why this camel wanted a neck so long as eight miles i will tell you the reason was that for all his fastings and penances he was a lazy camel and he wanted to graze without the trouble of walking about and now he could easily graze for a distance of eight miles all around a circle without moving from the spot where he lay but it was rather dangerous though he thought nothing of that for when his head was grazing a few miles away the hunters might stick a spear into his body or tie his legs together without his seeing them all the summer the camel had a fine time of it he lay still and comfortable and sent his head foraging around and strange to say no harm happened to him but before long the rainy season began in the rainy season there are storms every day and it rains cats and dogs so when the rain began the camel wanted to keep dry but he could not at first find a shed or a shelter eight miles long or anything like it at last he lit on a long winding cave that held most of his long neck so he ran his neck into the cave and lay still with the rain pouring upon his body this was bad enough but worse was to come for it happened that in this cave lived a he-jackal and a she-jackal when the jackals saw this extraordinary neck winding along their cave they were frightened and hid away what is this snake asked the he-jackal to his wife oh dear i don't know whimpered his wife i never saw a snake like this they kept quiet the head passed out of view into the inner part of the cave then after a while the creature lay still let us smell him said the jackal they smelt him he smells nice said the she jackal not a bit like a snake let us taste him said he jackal they took a bite the camel stirred restlessly they took another bite and liked that better still they went on biting the camel curled round his head to see what was going on but before the camel's head could get back more than a mile or two he grew so weak from loss of blood that he could move no more and he died 
so died the idle camel because the god granted him his foolish wish perhaps our wishes are often just as foolish if we only knew it and perhaps if they were fulfilled they would be the bane of us as happened to the lazy and religious camel the quail and the fowler a fowler once caught a quail said the quail to the fowler o oh, fowler i know four things that will be useful for you to know what are they asked the fowler well said the quail i don't mind telling you three of them now the first is fast caught fast keep never let a thing go when once you have got it the second is he is a fool that believes everything he hears and the third is this it's of no use crying over spilt milk the fowler thought these very sensible maxims and what is the fourth he asked ah said the quail you must set me free if you want to hear the fourth the fowler who was a simple fellow set the quail free the quail fluttered up into the tree and said i see you take no notice of what i tell you fast caught fast keep i said and yet you have let me go why so i have said the fowler and scratched his head he was a foolish fowler i think well never mind what is the fourth thing you promised to tell me and i am sure an honourable quail will never break his word the fourth thing i have to tell you is this in my inside is a beautiful diamond weighing ten pounds and if you had not let me go you would have had that diamond and you need never have done any more work in all your life oh dear oh dear what a fool i am cried the fowler he fell on his face and clutched at the grass and began to cry ah <laughs> laughed the quail he is a fool who believes everything he hears eh, what said the fowler and stopped crying do you think a little carcass like mine can hold a diamond as big as your head asked the quail roaring with laughter and even if it were true where's the use of crying over spilt milk the quail spread his wings good-bye said he better luck next time fowler and he flew away the fowler sat up well said he that's true sure enough he got up and brushed the mud off his clothes if i've lost a quail said he i've learnt something and he went home a sadder but a wiser man the king of the kites a mouse one day met a frog whom he knew very well but the frog turned up his flat nose and would not speak to him friend frog said the mouse why are you so proud to-day because i am king of the kites said froggy you must not suppose that this means a paper kite with a tail there is a kind of bird called a kite it is like a hawk only bigger how absurd it was of this frog who could not even fly to call himself the king of the kites and the mouse was just as absurd for he answered stuff and nonsense i am king of the kites i don't know whether they really believed this themselves or whether they were only trying to show off anyhow both stuck to it stoutly and a pretty quarrel was the result the mouse grew red in the face and as for froggy he was nearly bursting with rage at last they agreed to refer the decision to a council the council was made up of a bat a squirrel and a parrot the parrot took the chair because he was the biggest and also because he could talk most and was therefore thought to be wise i vote for the mouse said the bat not that he knew anything about it but you see a bat is very like a mouse and he wanted to stand up for the family and i said the squirrel vote for my friend froggy he knew nothing about it either but he wanted to show that even a squirrel has an opinion of his own so it fell to the parrot to give the casting vote and decide the matter he took a long time to decide about two hours and while he was thinking and the others were all intent to hear what he should say down from the sky swooped a kite and the kite stuck one claw into the mouse's back and one claw into the frog and carried them both away to his nest and ate them for dinner so that was the end of the two kings of the kites the other three creatures in a great fright made themselves scarce lest the kite should come back and eat them too 
The Jackal and the Camel once a camel was grazing in a forest he had a ring in his nose as the custom is and to the ring was tied a string by which the camel's master used to lead him about as the camel grazed the leading string became entangled in a bush and the camel could not get it loose the misfortune so much confused the mind of the camel that he did not know what to do suddenly as the camel was struggling to get free from the bush a jackal appeared brother jackal said the camel do please set me free from this bush brother camel said the jackal i will set you free only you must pay me for it do not the wise say even a brother will not serve thee for nothing what shall i pay you brother jackal i am a very poor camel you shall pay me quoth the jackal a pound of your flesh this was a hard condition but there was nothing for it better to lose a pound of my flesh thought the camel than lose my life so he agreed to pay the jackal a pound of flesh then the jackal set the camel free and the camel sat down on the ground and said i am ready take your pound of flesh open your mouth then said the jackal why asked the camel because i choose to take my pound of flesh from your tongue this was a terrible blow the camel could not agree because he knew that if his tongue were torn out he was bound to die so he said i did not promise you my tongue you did said the jackal don't tell lies said the camel where are your witnesses away trotted the jackal to find a witness first he asked the lion if he would bear witness that he heard the camel promise to give his tongue he promised to give him the half of all he should get as a reward go away said the king of beasts i am a lion not a liar then he asked the tiger but the tiger said i don't care for camel's meat so it isn't worth my while and so the jackal tried one beast after another but none of them would help him until he came to the wolf friend wolf said the jackal if you will only swear that you heard the camel promise me his tongue you shall have half half a tongue quoth the wolf that's poor provender no no said the jackal half the camel don't you see that if we tear out his tongue the camel will soon bleed to death true so he will said the wolf well i agree so the wolf and the jackal went back to the camel and the wolf said raising his right forepaw to heaven i swear by heaven that i heard this camel promise to give his tongue to this jackal of course this was a lie and they all knew it but the camel did not like to appear mean and besides they were two to one very well said the camel come and take it the camel opened his mouth wide the jackal put his head in the camel's mouth and as he did so the camel curled his tongue backward so that the jackal could not reach it the jackal pulled his head out again and said to the wolf my mouth is too small you try now you have a big gape then the wolf put his head in the camel's mouth the camel curled his tongue back and back and the wolf pushed in his head further and further at last all the wolf's head was inside then the camel snapped his jaws together upon the wolf's head oh daddy camel said the wolf half throttle what is this this said the camel rolling up the white of his eyes to the sky in a most pious fashion this is the result of telling a lie the camel said nothing at all but simply throttled the wolf to death and the jackal ran away i think you will agree with me that the jackal who made the wolf tell a lie was wickeder than the wolf who told it but yet he laughed at the wolf and got off himself scot-free this often happens in this world but we will hope that some other time his sin was bound to find him out the wise old shepherd once upon a time a snake went out of his hole to take an airing he crawled about greatly enjoying the scenery and the fresh whiff of the breeze until seeing an open door he went in now this door was the door of the palace of the king and inside was the king himself with all his courtiers imagine their horror at seeing a huge snake crawling in at the door they all ran away except the king who felt that his rank forbade him to be a coward and the king's son 
the king called out for somebody to come and kill the snake but this horrified them still more because in that country the people believed it to be wicked to kill any living thing even snakes and scorpions and wasps so the courtiers did nothing but the young prince obeyed his father and killed the snake with his stick after a while the snake's wife became anxious and set out in search of her husband she too saw the open door of the palace and in she went oh horror there on the floor lay the body of her husband all covered with blood and quite dead no one saw the snake's wife crawl in she inquired from a white ant what had happened and when she found that the young prince had killed her husband she made a vow that as he had made her a widow so she would make his wife a widow that night while all the world was asleep the snake crept into the prince's bedroom and coiled around his neck the prince slept on and when he awoke in the morning he was surprised to find his neck encircled with the coils of a snake he was afraid to stir so there he remained until the prince's mother became anxious and went in to see what was the matter when she entered his room and saw him in this plight she gave a loud shriek and ran off to tell the king call the archers said the king the archers came and the king told them to go into the prince's room and shoot the snake that was coiled about his neck they were so clever that they could easily do this without hurting the prince at all in came the archers in a row fitted the arrows to the bows the bows were raised ready to shoot when on a sudden from the snake there issued a voice which spoke as follows o oh, archers wait and hear me before you shoot it is not fair to carry out the sentence before you have heard the case is not this good law an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is it not so o king yes replied the king that is our law then said the snake i plead the law your son has made me a widow so it is fair and right that i should make his wife a widow that sounds right enough said the king but right and law are not always the same thing we had better ask somebody who knows they asked all the judges but none of them could tell the law of the matter they shook their heads and said they would look up all their law books and see whether anything of the sort had ever happened before and if so how it had been decided that is the way judges used to decide cases in that country though i dare say it sounds to you a very funny way it looked as if they had not much sense in their own heads and perhaps that was true the upshot of all was that not a judge would give any opinion so the king sent messengers all over the countryside to see if they could find somebody somewhere who knew something one of the messengers found a party of five shepherds who were sitting upon a hill and trying to decide a quarrel of their own they gave their opinion so freely and in language so very strong that the king's messenger said to himself here are the men for us here are five men each with an opinion of his own and all different post haste he scurried back to the king and told him he had found at last some one ready to judge the knotty point so the king and the queen and the prince and the princess and all the courtiers got on horseback and away they galloped to the hill whereupon the five shepherds were sitting and the snake too went with them coiled round the neck of the prince when they got to the shepherd's hill the shepherds were dreadfully frightened at first they thought that the strangers were a gang of robbers and when they saw that it was the king their next thought was that one of their misdeeds had been found out and each of them began thinking what was the thing he had done and wondering was it that but the king and his court got off their horses and said good day in the most civil way so the shepherds felt their minds set at ease again then the king said worthy shepherds we have a question to put to you which not all the judges in all the courts of my city have been able to solve here is my son and here as you see is a snake coiled round his neck now the husband of this snake came creeping into my palace hall and my son the prince killed him 
so this snake who is the wife of the other says that as my son has made her a widow so she has a right to widow my son's wife what do you think about it the first shepherd said i think she's quite right my lord king if any one made my wife a widow i should pretty soon do the same to him this was brave language and the other shepherds shook their heads and looked fierce but the king was puzzled and could not quite understand it you see in the first place if the man's wife were a widow the man would be dead and then it is hard to see how he could do anything so to make sure the king asked the second shepherd whether that was his opinion too yes said the second shepherd now the prince has killed the snake the snake has a right to kill the prince if he can but that was not much of use either as the snake was as dead as a doornail so the king passed on to the third i agree with my mates said the third shepherd because you see a prince is a prince but then a snake is a snake that was quite true they all admitted but it did not seem to help the matter much then the king asked the fourth shepherd to say what he thought the fourth shepherd said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth so i think a widow should be a widow if so be she don't marry again by this time the poor king was so puzzled that he hardly knew whether he stood on his head or his heels but there was still the fifth shepherd left the oldest and wisest of them all and the fifth shepherd said o oh, king i should like to ask two questions ask twenty if you like said the king he did not promise to answer them so he could afford to be generous first i asked the princess how many sons she has four said the princess and how many sons has mistress snake here seven said the snake then said the old shepherd it will be quite fair for mistress snake to kill his highness the prince when her highness the princess has had three sons more oh i never thought of that said the snake good-bye king and all you good people send a message when the princess has had three more sons and you may count upon me i will not fail you so saying she uncoiled from the prince's neck and slid away among the grass the king and the prince and everybody shook hands with the wise old shepherd and went home again and as the princess never had any more sons at all she and the prince lived happily for many years and if they are not dead they are living still end of part two part three of the talking thrush and other tales from india retold by w h d rouse this librivox recording is in the public domain part three beware of bad company the foolish wolf reflected glory the cat and the sparrows the foolish fish the clever goat beware of bad company a beautiful young swan lived by a beautiful lake all day long he used to sail gracefully over the water curving his neck to look at his own image or pluming his white wings and when he was tired he would go to his nest in the rushes and sleep or play with his brothers and sisters in a tree above that lake was a crow you know that crows are dirty birds and they feed on offal and refuse and people dislike them but the swan was white and clean still strange as it may seem this swan struck up a fast friendship with the crow his mother and father begged him to keep out of bad company but he would not listen to them he had done better to keep to his own kind but wilful will have its way and the swan was sorry for it too late one day the crow said to his friend the swan come old boy let's go and have some fun i'm your swan said the other and away they flew they came to a tree and under the tree was a very pious man saying his prayers here's a joke said the crow now we shall see sport he picked up a lump of mud from the ground and flew up into the tree and then he dropped the mud splash on the pious man's head 
this interrupted his prayers and he could not help feeling angry although he was so pious so up he got and looked about to see who had done the mischief by this time the mischievous crow had flown off and he was caw-caw cawing on another tree out of reach but the swan sat still he was not learned in mischief and he did not know what to do then the pious man looked up into the tree and saw the swan sitting there so of course he thought it was the swan who had dropped a piece of mud on his head he had a big catapult with him so he put a stone in his catapult and slick he shot the swan down fell the swan with a great thud he felt that his end was near and how sorry he was now that he had had anything to do with the bad crow however it was too late now to be sorry so he began to sing they say that swans never sing in all their life but when they are about to die they sing beautifully and this is what the swan sang to the pious man i am no crow as you must know but a swan that lived by a lovely lake with bad companions i would go and now i die for a bad friend's sake then the swan died and the pious man finished his prayers the foolish wolf a wolf and an ass were great friends and they spent most of their time playing at an original game of their own the game was easy enough to learn you could play it yourselves and it was this first the ass used to run away from the wolf as hard as he could and the wolf used to follow and then the wolf would run as hard as he could from the ass and the ass would follow one day as the wolf was running away full tilt from the ass a boy saw them ha 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 said the boy what a coward that wolf is to run away from an ass he thought you see that the wolf was afraid of being eaten by the ass the wolf heard him and was very angry he stopped short and said to the boy so you think i am a coward little boy you shall rue the word i'm brave enough to eat you as you shall find out this very night for i will come and carry you off from your home if the wolf was no coward at least he was a foolish wolf to tell the boy if he meant to carry him off as i think you will agree with me the boy went home to tell his mother mother said he a wolf is coming to-night to carry me off oh never mind if he does said the boy's mother he won't hurt you the boy did not feel quite so sure about that for he had seen sharp teeth in the mouth of the wolf so he chose out a big and sharp stone and put it in his pocket why he did not hide i can't tell you for he never told me but my private opinion is he was almost as foolish as the wolf well when night came the boy's mother went to bed and she was soon snoring but the boy stayed up to wait for the wolf about ten o'clock came a knock on the door come in said the boy the wolf opened the door and came in and says he now boy you must come along with me all right said the boy mother doesn't mind i have never been able to understand why his mother did not mind but perhaps he was a very naughty boy and she was glad to get rid of him if he did nothing but pull his sister's hair and put spiders down their necks he was just as well out of the house i think so the boy got on the wolf's back and the wolf trotted off briskly to his den then the wolf thought to himself i have had my dinner and i don't want any boy to-night suppose i leave him for to-morrow and go for a spin with my friend the jackass so he left the boy in his den and off he went after the jackass what makes me think more than ever that he was a foolish wolf is that he never even tied the boy's legs together so when the wolf was gone the boy went out of the den and climbed up a tree in an hour or two back came the wolf ready for bed he looked in at the mouth of the den but no boy where on earth has that boy got to said he i left him here safe and sound it never occurred to this wolf that legs can walk and boys can climb trees he felt very anxious and as many people do when their wits are puzzled he opened his mouth wide 
The boy saw him standing at the opening of the den with his mouth wide open, so he pulled the sharp stone out of his pocket and threw it in. This boy was a very good shot with a stone, and the stone went straight into the wolf's inside and cut his inside so much that he died. Then the boy climbed down from the tree, and he was at home in time for breakfast. I don't know whether his mother was pleased to see him or not, but there he was and there he stayed, and if he has not gone away, he is there still. REFLECTED GLORY There was a shepherd who owned a multitude of goats. Among these was one goat, weak and lame. You may suppose that the shepherd took special care of this lame goat, but not he. On the contrary, he beat him and bullied him, and made his whole life a misery. A time came when the lame goat could stand it no longer. So, watching his chance, he gave his master the slip and into the forest and far away. As he hobbled along, he trembled to think of the ferocious beasts that the forest was full of, but even to be devoured by an evil beast was better far than to be for ever beaten. The lame goat made up his mind that the only way by which he could save his life was to gain the protection of some powerful beast. So he kept his eyes open as he hobbled along, and by and by what should he see but a dark cave, and at the mouth of the cave a lion's footprints. Now a lion was just the beast the goat wanted, for to begin with he is the king of beasts, and all the other beasts fear him. And then, too, he is a noble beast, and if he passes his word, he will never break it. Of course, it might be that the lion would eat our goat first and ask questions afterwards, but the goat had to take his chance of that. The upshot of it was that the lame goat sat down by the lion's den and waited. By and by, trippity-trip, trippity-trip, and up came a jackal, said the jackal to the goat, god bless you gaffer goat you'll be the first food that has passed my lips this many a day dear grandson said the goat god bless you too i'm here to be eaten that is true enough but i meet for your betters he whose footprints you see here has bidden me wait until he wants me the jackal looked at the footprints and saw they were a lion's aha thought he let sleeping dogs lie if i eat the lion's meat the lion will devour my cubs then he went away sorrowful a little while and trippity trap trippity trap up came a wolf quoth the wolf well met uncle goat you make my mouth water a five days fast is sauce for the dinner well met my dear nephew says the lame goat but you had better leave me alone i'm food for your betters look upon these footprints and let me tell you that he who made them has bidden me wait here until he is hungry ho ho said the wolf a lion who tackles the strong will not live long if i eat king lion's meat king lion will make a meal of my cubs away went the wolf trappity trip trappity trip a little while more and swish 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 the lion himself came stalking slowly along whisking away the flies with his tail when he saw the goat sitting beside his den says he friend goat what want you here are you anxious to make a meal for me oh king lion said the goat bowing before him very humbly here i have been sitting these two hours and wolves and jackals came to eat me but the sight of your footprints was safety for me I told them I was yours, and they took to their heels for fear. Now eat me if you will, for yours I am. Then the lion said, O oh goat, if you have called yourself mine, never will I devour you. I will see to it that you are well treated. Then the lion went out and found an elephant, who greeted him with the greatest respect. Elephant, said the lion, I want you to do something for me speak on said the elephant do it i will the lion said there is a poor lame goat has thrown himself on my mercy and i have thought of a plan by which he can be fed if you will suffer him to mount on your back then while you go grazing about he can browse upon the young shoots of the trees as you pass under 
that is a good idea said the elephant and i'll do it for you willingly and indeed anything else in my power if the lion was pleased at the kindness of the elephant more pleased was the lame goat and a happy life was his from that day never again was he beaten by a cruel goat herd but he fed on the fat of the land and lived to a green old age and i hope we may be half as happy as he was the cat and the sparrows there was once a pair of sparrows that lived in a tree they used to hop about all over the place picking up seeds or anything they could find to eat one day when they came back with their pickings the cock had found some rice and the hen a few lentils they put it all in an earthen pot and then proceeded to cook their dinner then they divided the mess into two equal parts the cock was rather greedy so he would not wait while his wife put out the fire and got ready to join in the meal no he gobbled up his share at once before she could begin when at last the poor hen came up her greedy mate would not let her rest even then go and get me a drink of water he said quite rudely she was a very kind wife so without taking any notice of his rudeness off she went for the water while she was gone the cock sparrow's eye fell on his wife's share of the dinner ah thought he how i should like another bit well why shouldn't i have it a man does all the work and women don't want much to eat at any time so without any more ado he just set to and gobbled up his wife's share back came the hen sparrow with a drink of water for her husband when he had drunk it up and i am afraid he forgot to say thank you she turned round to look for her dinner lo and behold there was none what could have become of it as she was wondering she happened to look at her husband he looked so guilty that there could be no manner of doubt where her dinner was you greedy bird said she why have you eaten my dinner i haven't touched your dinner said the cock angrily i'm sure you have said she or you would not look so guilty why you are actually blushing and so indeed he was the tip of his beak was quite red however he still denied it and grew angrier and angrier as people do when they know that they are in the wrong they had a terrible quarrel at last the hen sparrow said well i know a way to find out whether you are telling lies or not you come along with me and she made him go with her to the well across the top of the well she stretched a piece of string and she sat on the middle of the string and began to chirp if i am telling lies i pray i may fall in but though she sat there a long time chirping away she did not fall in then came the cock sparrow's turn he perched on the string and began to chirrup if i am telling lies may i fall into the well but hardly had he got the words out of his mouth when splash down he went then the hen was very sorry that she had proposed this plan she began to weep and cheep and said alas alas why didn't i leave it alone what does it matter if he eats my dinner so long as i have my dear husband now i have killed him by my folly just at that moment up came a cat what's the matter said the cat cheep 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 said the hen sparrow my husband has fallen into the well and i don't know how to get him out if i get him out said the cat will you let me eat him of course you may said the hen sparrow so the cat climbed down and pulled out the cock sparrow when she had brought him to the edge of the well said she now i'm going to eat him as you promised oh all right said the hen but stop a minute your mouth is dirty i am sure you have been eating mice now haven't you why yes said the cat so i have well said the hen sparrow you must get yourself clean we birds are clean creatures and you must positively wash your mouth before you begin away went the cat and washed her mouth clean and came back again the hen sparrow looked at her carefully you have not washed your whiskers said she they are still dirty the cat went obediently and washed her whiskers meanwhile the cock sparrow had been sitting on the edge of the well in the sun and by this time his feathers were quite dry 
so his hen chirped to him now dear you can fly let's be off and off they flew together and the cat was left licking her chops and wishing she had not been such a fool the foolish fish a fish was once flapping and flopping on the sand by the banks of a river she was a lady fish how she got there i don't know but she had been better to stay at home as you shall hear well she flapped away on the sand and couldn't get off she began to feel very dry a man came by riding upon a horse oh man shouted the fish do carry me back to the water again or i shall be dried up and die no no said the man not i indeed you are a she and i have had so much bother with she's in my life that i shall keep clear of you oh dear good man cried the fish do please help me and i will promise not to behave badly i'll be as nice as any man could be just think if you leave me here i shall dry into a stick or somebody will come along and eat me the man scratched his head and wondered what he ought to do but at last he took pity on the fish and got down off his horse then he picked up the fish and put her on his shoulder and walked down to the water now then said he in with you take me into deep water said the fish this won't do for me so the good-natured fellow took her and waded into the water till he was neck deep then the fish opened her mouth wide and said now i'm going to eat you i'll teach you to say nasty things about women that was a nice way of showing gratitude to the man wasn't it i wonder the man did not eat the fish instead of the fish eating him but i am afraid the man was rather stupid it never occurred to him that he might eat the fish and all he did was to scratch his head again that's not fair said he i saved your life and now you want to eat me we must find someone to decide between us and say which is right all right said the fish take me up on your shoulder again and let us find somebody so the man took her up on his shoulder again and out of the water came he on the bank of the river grew a crab-apple tree and the man appealed to this tree to decide their dispute oh tree said he this fish was lying on the sand and i saved her life and now she wants to eat me do you think that is right of course said the tree whose temper was as crabbed as his apples of course why not you men are always doing mischief here am i an innocent crab-apple tree and people come along and cut off my branches to shade themselves from the sun i call that cool well said the man they want to be cool and that's why they cut your branches off don't be a fool squeaked the crab-apple tree you know what i mean so as you do all this damage to us we are right to do all we can to hurt you and therefore this fish has a right to eat you if she chooses come along said the fish as she opened her mouth jump in wait a bit said the man we must try somebody else i feel sure there is something wrong with this judgment the fish did not wish to ask anybody else but she had to agree because they were on dry land so they went along until they saw an elephant oh elephant cried the man do you see this fish i saved her life and now she wants to eat me do you think this is right right said the elephant i should rather think so why you men are horrid brutes always making us carry half a dozen of you about on our backs or prodding us with a spike or something nasty eat you up i only wish i could eat you up and i would do it too but nature makes me eat leaves and you are too tough for me to digest so there was no comfort to be had from the elephant the fish opened her mouth wider than ever for she was getting hungry and said now then look sharp in with you the man was in despair what was he to do give me one more chance said he and if they all say the same then you shall eat me he looked round and not far off he saw a jackal friend jackal he cried out i say jackal stop a minute i want to ask you something oh all right said the jackal ask away the fish said the man was flip flapping around on the sand and gasping for breath and i saved her life and then as soon as she got safe back into the water again 
she wanted to eat me do you think that's right hm said the jackal i don't quite understand where was the fish lying on the sand you booby said the fish getting angry how asked the jackal why said the fish what is that matter i should like to know can't understand said the jackal looking stupidly all around and then up at the sky well said the fish angrier than ever all you are asked to do is to say whether or no i am to eat this man can't you do that without all this bother no said the jackal oh dear said the fish what a stupid you must be all right then come along and we'll show you so she made the man take her on his shoulder again and carry her to the place where she had been lying on the sand that's the place said she the jackal was not satisfied yet but he must needs see how she lay so the man put her down on the sand and the fish began flip flap flopping again now then said the jackal to the man up on the horse with you and be off what does the fish matter to you let her die she deserves no better the man thought this was a good idea so he got up on his horse and off and was more resolved than ever to keep clear of women but the fish was very angry at being tricked so neatly you shall pay for this she gasped to the jackal i'll come and eat you in your den all right you may try said the jackal but i fancy you will get eaten yourself and so saying away he scampered the fish flapped and flopped until somehow or other she managed to flap herself into the water after this the fish used to sit by the roots of a fig tree which went down into the river with her mouth gaping in the hope that something might fall in the jackal used to come down to this place to drink and one day as he was drinking the fish caught him tight by the leg oh you silly fish said the jackal why didn't you catch my leg you have got hold of the wrong thing said he there's my leg if you want it pointing to the root of the fig tree the foolish fish believed she had made a mistake and let go the jackal's leg and took a good bite out of the root the jackal laughed and scampered away crying oh what a fool you are you don't know wood from me never mind said the fish next time it will be my turn and then we shall see i'll come and eat you in your den next day when the jackal had gone into the forest to find food our friend the fish jumped out of the water and went roll roll rolling into the forest until she came to the den of the jackal and inside the door of the jackal's den she stood on her tail waiting for him to come back by and by back came the jackal sure enough but jackals are very cunning creatures and he came up slinking quietly and saw the fish before the fish saw him so he called out in a loud voice den den no answer again he called out den den this time the fish thought that the den was no doubt accustomed to reply when the jackal called to it perhaps it was shy because she was present anyhow she thought she had better answer so she called out in return well well you there asked the jackal yes i'm here all right answered the fish just stop a minute said the jackal and i'll be back directly away he ran and the fish crept inside the hole and hid the jackal ran about gathering dry leaves and with the leaves he made a little pile at the mouth of his hole then he went to a fire which some traveller had left smouldering and seizing a brand he brought it and set light to the leaves at the mouth of the cave the fire soon burned up is that nice dear den asked the jackal very nice thank you said the fish who thought she must go on pretending i'll soon make you warm said the jackal and he piled on more fuel it began to get very hot that's enough now said the fish no no den dear said the cunning jackal laughing to himself more and more leaves he piled on the top of the fire one side of the fish got so hot that she turned the other then it got hotter and hotter and soon the fish expired when the fire went out the jackal looked into the cave and there was the fish done on both sides crisp and brown he sat down on his haunches and gobbled her up in a trice 
and he never had a nicer dinner that was the end of the foolish and ungrateful fish the clever goat a shepherd was feeding his flock on the hills and as they were going home again in the evening one of the goats lagged behind now this goat was very old and goats are not like men for the older they grow the wiser they become so this goat being very old indeed was also very wise there was a very nice clump of grass by the wayside and the wise old goat said to himself here is the nicest grass i have seen for a long time i'm not hungry because i have been eating all day but i dare say i shall soon be hungry again so i had better eat it while i can get it and accordingly she set to work and very soon she had eaten it all up and then she trotted homeward as the old goat went merrily trotting along with her eyes on the ground suddenly she looked up and lo and behold a huge wolf sitting on a stump and staring at her hungrily what was she to do to escape was impossible she pulled her wits together and began oh my dear mr wolf cried she how delighted i am to see you i have been looking for you all day and now i found you at last the wolf was so utterly astonished that he had not a word to say at first but after a while he found his tongue and thus he said my good goat you must be out of your senses why i'm accustomed to feed on goats and here you say you are glad to see me who ever heard of a creature so foolish as to throw itself into the jaws of death of its own free will ah cried the goat you don't know my shepherd that's quite clear he is the kindest man in the world and he has a special weakness for you he was talking of you only this morning and saying that he owes you a good turn for not gobbling up any of his sheep though it is ever so long since he began to feed them in your forest so he has sent me to you as a token of his esteem i'm an old goat you see and not much use to him now no ifs and buts says he to me off with you and let kind mr wolf eat you for his dinner and so here i am and indeed you must not suppose i am here against my will not at all i could not think of disobeying our good shepherd and if i did he could sell me to the butcher to have my throat cut and be eaten by horrid beasts of men who have only two legs to bless themselves with i assure you i much prefer being eaten by a noble four-legged gentleman like yourself our wolf was still so surprised that he could find nothing to say and the goat went on do not think dear sir that i am flattering you look at me and judge if a respectable old goat of my age and at the point of death for i see you licking your chops whether i say such a one would dare to tell lies but mr wolf there is one reason why i shall be sorry to die you may not have heard of it but it is true nevertheless that i am a famous songster and it will be indeed a pity that a gift so rare should be lost will you do me one last favour and let me sing you a song before i die i am sure it will delight you and you will enjoy eating me all the more afterwards the wolf was very much pleased at the goat's politeness well said he since you are so kind as to offer i should like to hear what you can do in the way of music all right said our goat just sit down on the hillock yonder and i'll stay here it won't sound so nice if i am too near you the wolf trotted off to the hillock and sat down and waited for the goat to begin her song the goat opened her mouth and uttered aloud ba 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 is that all asked the wolf he was rather disappointed but he did not say so for fear of being thought an ignorant lout oh no said the goat that was only tuning up to get the pitch then she cried again ba 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 louder than before meanwhile the shepherd was not far off and he heard this loud ba ba of one of his goats hello thought he what's up i wonder and set off running in the direction of the sound just as the wolf was getting impatient and the goat was opening her mouth for another ba ba up came the shepherd behind the wolf thwack 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 came his stick on the stupid wolf and with a groan the wolf turned over and died on the spot 
the shepherd and his wise old goat trudged happily home to the sheepfold and after that the goat took good care to keep with the flock end of part three